Everybody said, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We're asking, Lord, that you enrich our lives with your word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Open the pages of the scriptures to us. Amen. Speak to everyone directly. Amen. Lead us in the right path. Amen. Let your work prosper in every hand in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I welcome everyone tonight. And I pray the Lord will open our eyes to see what he wants us to see. And to know what he wants us to know. And the word will energize us and empower us to do great and mighty things. Even in this our generation in Jesus name. We are coming to Titus chapter 3. I am reading from verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. I want you to underline those two words there, good works. Good works. Verse 14. And let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Underline those words, good works. As we come to the conclusion of the epistle of Paul to Titus, it reminds us that we are created unto good works. And that all who believe in the Lord, they believe unto salvation, were to rise up and to work for the Lord and to have good works. We seek to serve. If you are born again, there's a reason for that. There's a reason why after you are born again, you are not taken to heaven directly, immediately. Because you are to serve. Seek to serve. We are born to reproduce. You are born again. You are born into the kingdom of God. We must reproduce. Reproduce ourselves. What the Lord has done in us. We must make sure he does. In the lives of other people. Other people saw us when we were in sin. Knew nothing about salvation. And he came to us. We went to the Lord through their message. We became born again. The same thing will do for other people. Now that others have helped us. And were born again. They have reproduced, which you must reproduce. We're sanctified and set apart for soul winning. You have sanctified us. Actually, if you look at the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Immediately following that verse, he said, As you have sent me to the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Sanctified, set apart for soul winning. We're empowered to evangelize. He gives us the power of the Holy Ghost. And he says, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. There's a purpose for the endowment of power. Empowered so that we can evangelize. And so we who are new creatures in Christ are created unto good works. And these were to affirm constantly. You're a preacher, you're a pastor, you're a leader in the church, and you have people under your influence were affirm constantly. Here is the reason for salvation. Here is the purpose of our salvation. We affirm that those who have believed in the Lord must maintain good works. We are leaders and was the patterns of good works. We're not just telling other people, do it, do it. Do as I say, we'll do it ourselves. I said, we'll do it ourselves. And then we're to affirm to the workers, we're to train the workers, encourage the workers so that they will be people who have good works and they maintain good works. The same thing with all the members. No one is led to himself. 
to remain unfruitful. That's what you have in that chapter 3, verse 14. Let ours, that is those who belong to us, those who are part of this congregation, those who are children of God, and they are with us. It says, let ours also learn. They have to learn. All the things we need to know, they need to know. All the principles we need to affirm, we need to make very clear. Let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses so that they be not unfruitful. So that no one in the church, no worker in the church, no member in the church, no minister in the church will be unfruitful. It is our responsibility to teach and to train. We teach the people, we train the people, we teach them indoors, then we take them out to go and do the practical side. We instruct them, we influence them, we inspire them. We instruct them by the word that they must have good works, maintain good works. Not only that, we influence them by the way we live, by our own testimonies too. They're going out to evangelize. We too are going out to evangelize. They're going out to touch the lives of other people. We too are going out and we're influencing them to say, a leader is doing it to you. A pastor is doing it to you. Our um, coordinator is doing it to you. And we're to inspire them. Inspire them with good example. Inspire them with good illustration. Inspire them with the way we're winning converts. We're to disciple and develop them. Disciple them, develop them so that the people who are under us, they're not as they used to be. Because we're growing, they too, they're growing. And we do that for the whole church until everyone learns to maintain good works. What we're saying is that we ourselves as leaders, we're going back to Calvary. And then we're leading the people under us and we're taking everybody to Calvary so that everyone can be purified and everyone made zealous of good works. As we mention these good works, I want you to notice in the three chapters of Titus, look at Titus chapter 1 verse 16. Titus 1 verse 16. They profess that they know God. But in works, look at that, in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. It says you measure them, you evaluate them, you examine them, and you put value on them on the basis of the work they're doing. Are they into good works? Are they into evil works? The people that profess, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God, say, okay, stop talking, stop testifying. Where, are, where is the evidence? These people that just profess, Paul the Apostle says, they don't have any good works to show for that. That means then, the good works are very important, so that we'll know here is a Christian, here is a believer, here is a saved soul, is born to reproduce, and he has good works to show for it. Look at chapter 2 and verse 7. Chapter 2 verse 7, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of, tell me, of good works. You're a preacher, you're a pastor, you're a leader. It says you will show yourself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing of corruptness, gravity, sincerity. Look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and prefer unto himself a peculiar people. Tell me the rest. See lots of good works. Chapter 1, examine them. Do you see any good work there? If there's no good works there, it means that the testimony is, uh, is invalid. Their testimony is not valid. Their testimony is useless and empty and vain. And then it comes to chapter 2 and it says, uh, Titus, you yourself will be a pattern. You must show the example that you have, the good works we are talking about. And actually, all the people who are saved, all the people who are sanctified, all the people who are purified, they are purified so that they can become peculiar people, zealous of good works. Come to chapter 3. It says, this is a faithful sin. And these things I will. Titus, I put you there so that you can set things in order. I put you there so you can uphold the word of God. And it says, I will, I will, that thou affirm how often? I said how often? The church has gone to sleep. I said how often? That thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful might be serious, might be diligent to maintain, what are they maintaining? Good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Look at verse 14. 
let ours everyone examine them don't just preach and then you leave everybody to it you look at everybody you go around you're asking questions from that brother from that sister are you winning souls are you doing good works are you reproducing and are you serving the lord are you doing so winning are you empowered and are you empowering other people evangelizing it says let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful as we look at everything chapter one chapter two chapter three chapter two is the center and i'm going to uh, make this the pivot that is in chapter two i'm going to make that the center i'm going to look at verse 14 uh, very diligently and critically as we talk about the good works the message tonight the profitable zeal of christ's peculiar people the profitable zeal there's a kind of zeal that is not profitable uh, the, the zeal of the pharisees that's not profitable they go over land and sea and to make one proselyte and after they have made one proselyte that person becomes too false child of hell than them that one is not profitable there are people that have zeal but not according to knowledge and then paul the apostles i was like that before i had the same zeal that you are manifesting now as if uh, you know in circumcision and the law of Moses and ceremonies and all that. He said, we're not talking about that. That one is unprofitable. There are people that are, you know, so excited and talking about, you know, fables and Jewish stories. He said, that's not profitable. We're talking about profitable zeal of Christ's peculiar people. Come to chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself tell me a peculiar people zealous of good works the profitable zeal underline that word zeal very important the people who say that you know they're children of god there's no zeal in them there's no enthusiasm there's no excitement there's no fire inside them there's no push inside them there's no dream there's no goal there is no pursuit they're just like so so christian they're just like you know wishy washy christian they look warm they're stagnant they're cold you cannot depend upon them to heat anything up and to bring the fire of revival into any local church that's why it says when christ takes hold of us he pardons us he saves us he sanctifies us he purifies us and then he puts the fire of the holy ghost within us and he says these are peculiar people now and they are zealous of good works and i pray that all the zeal you need will come from heaven and drop in your soul yeah. and fire you up and everything he wants us to do in the fire power of the holy ghost we will do in jesus name what's the topic tonight tell me the profitable zeal of christ peculiar people three things number one the examples of christ's peculiar zealous people can we find people in the bible can we find people in contemporary times that can say that's an example that's a pattern that's a model and we have the examples of christ's peculiar zealous people point number two the earnestness if you are peculiar you'll be honest if you are zealous you'll be honest if you're on fire you'll be honest you will know that there is urgency about the work there's something we need to do and we must do that now the earnestness of christ's purified zealous people the earnestness of christ's purified zealous people number three the exploits the days of exploits have come I will do more exploits i said i will do more exploits this is the time christ is about to come you will be more than ordinary you'll be extraordinary you will climb higher mountains that you ever climbed in your life you will go farther than you ever went in your life you will reach people you have never reached you will see people you have never seen and you will do great miracles you have never done in jesus name 
Your life will not be so so life. Your life will not be humdrum life. Your life will not be well. We are there. We are there. We are just following. I always come to church. I always come for a worker's training and say, but where is the, what are you cooking? And where is the fire? Where is something that is really going on in the ministry God has called you to? You say, I'm still praying. You will conclude that prayer tonight. I'm still, you know, wanting to kind that you are going to start tonight in Jesus' name. Number three, the exploits of Christ's passionate, zealous people. Passionate, zealous people. The exploits of Christ's passionate, zealous people. We're coming to number one, the examples of Christ's peculiar, zealous people. I come to that Titus chapter two again. Uh, Titus chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 14, it says, who gave himself for us, talking about Christ, who died for us on the cross of Calvary for salvation, for sanctification, for redemption, for cleansing, for breaking every yoke, and snapping and like, shattering all those fetters. That's why he died, and to remove every cause, and then to save us, and preserve us, and protect us from this present evil world. He gave himself for us, so that he can transfer his life, transfer his ministry into our lives, so that we can say, the life I now live, I live by the face of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, he did that, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Look up here for a moment. You know what Christ actually came to do? Look at Adam and Eve coming from the hands of God before the fall. And it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And the Lord made them and he looked at them and looked at all the creation and he said everything he made was very good. And there was no sin, there was no depravity, there was no iniquity, there was no transgression. Everything was perfect until the time of the fall. And then you know the story about the fall. You see, did my mother conceive me? You see, what was I born? Equity was I born? And now sin has come and prevailed over everyone all over the world. But Christ now has come. He wants to take us from where we are. He wants to take us to the point before the fall. He wants to so cleanse us, purge us, purify us, sanctify us, that we will be like what Adam was before the time of the fall. Calvary can do that. The sacrifice of Jesus can do that. And if you believe in the Lord, it will be unto you according to your faith. That's why it says he gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Actually, the Lord wanted Israel to be like that. That was the dream, that was the goal, that was the pursuit, that was the purpose of the Almighty God. Look at Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 5. Exodus chapter 19, peculiar people, peculiar people. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, it says, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people, for all the earth is mine. You see, from that time, God had the intention that he wanted the children of Israel, every one of them, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, everyone that is in Israel, to get back to the time before the fall, so that these will be peculiar. They'd be different from the Canaanites, different from the Hittites, different from the Jebusites, different from everyone and it says, if you will obey my voice indeed, this is what I will do. Look at this, verse 6. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. A kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Peculiar people. Psalm 135. Psalm 135. I'm reading from verse 4. 135 in the Psalms, verse 4. For the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his, tell me, peculiar treasure. That's what he wanted to do. He has chosen them, and he wanted to demonstrate his power, the power to purify, the power to sanctify, the power to make holy, the power to cleanse, the power to make them so different and so distinct, they'd be peculiar treasure. But Israel did not follow 
after God's desire, God's dream, God's plan, God's purpose for them. Does that mean that God gave up that intention, that plan, that purpose, that dream, that goal, that there will be no peculiar people anymore? Come to First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 9. First Peter chapter 2. I'll be peculiar. You see, when you look at the promises of God, you look at the purpose of God, you see that this is what God says He wants to do. And then you plug in, you connect, and you say, that's what God wants to do, and I'm going to be a candidate for that, and I connect to the purpose of God, I connect to the plan of God, I connect to the power of God, it will be fulfilled in your life. In First Peter, First Peter, First Peter, chapter two, verse nine. But ye are a chosen generation. Somebody said, Amen. Amen. A royal priesthood. Another, Amen. Amen. And holy nation. Look at this. Look at this. A peculiar people. A peculiar people. Say, ye are, ye are. What Christ has done on the cross of Calvary is so that ye, all of you, all of you are part of the church. All of you who are born again, all of you have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. It says that you are a peculiar people. Then it says for a purpose that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light he has called us and we're going to fulfill that purpose his plan that's the plan of christ his purpose that's the purpose of christ his priority that's the priority of christ for giving himself for us it's very clear it is nothing less than making each of us on earth a spectacle to angels in heaven purged purified so that we can be peculiar. But you see at this time in point number one, we're looking for examples of peculiar, zealous people. Examples. And the question is, are there examples, there are many, many examples, have they put them together and I've tidied it up, peculiar, peculiar. Give me a peculiar, the letters of peculiar. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight. We're going to look at P for Paul, E for Elijah, C for Caleb, U for Raya, L for Luke, I for Isaiah, A for Apollos, R. Or Rechabites, the Rechabites. As you look at the stories of these people, these were the people like you and I. They were as ordinary as you and I were ordinary. They were sinners as all people on earth were sinners. They were ignorant as all the people on earth were ignorant. But one day came, and this particular day for each of them, they had the voice of God, they had the call of God, and they yielded to that call of God, and they gave themselves to the Lord, and then they allowed the Lord to make them like He wanted to make them. They were clay in the hand of the Almighty God, and the Lord became the potter, and He fashioned them, He remolded them, and they came out, they came forth, peculiar people. If God has done it for them, He'll do it for you. Peculiar people, examples. We're looking at Paul now, and we're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Think about that. It saw the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, saw Saul. Why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for you to kick against the prince and then he said what will you have me to do his career changed at that point his direction changed at that point and his goal his mind everything changed at that time and the lord told him what you will do and then now he's giving testimony he said agrippa i've not been disobedient to that heavenly vision as the lord called him and you will see that he said i am what i am by the grace of god it became totally peculiar different different from peter different from john different from matthew different from all those other apostles and he went to places 
where other people never went. He climbed mountains other people never climbed. He went to prison that no other person got to. He did miracles that no other person did. And he went with the gospel everywhere. He was peculiar. Look at this. They need to understand. If you're peculiar, people will not understand you. They'll think you're mad. They think that something is wrong with you upstairs. They think you're eccentric. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, it says, And as see he thus speak for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. That, that, that's the person who is peculiar. You are, you are beside yourself. Much learning does make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad. Was he mad? Well, an excited man. He was an enthusiastic man. He was a peculiar man. He was a different man. He was a distinct person. He was a person on fire for the Lord. And therefore, Festus thought this was madness. But he said, I am not my most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, King Agrippa, tell me, believest thou the prophets? He didn't even allow him to answer. I know thou believest. And then King Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You see, that was a peculiar person. That's the spirit which God is transferring to your heart today. And then we have another person, his name is Elijah. We're coming to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. The whole nation had backslid him. The whole nation had gone away from the Lord. And they were following Baal. And uh, this Elijah just came uh, almost from nowhere. And he gathered the people together. 1 Kings chapter 18. Uh, and I'm reading from verse 21. 1 Kings chapter 18 uh, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold she between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But he Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. He didn't, he didn't give any answer at all. But you see, when they don't answer like that, a peculiar preacher does not stop. A peculiar prophet does not stop. A peculiar messenger of God will not stop. He went on. He said, I'm the only one on this side. And then on the other side, you have hundreds of uh, prophets of Baal. Let them take uh, something for sacrifice and let them pray to their God. And the God that answers by fire, that will be the God we're going to serve. And the people agreed with that. And those people, they did all the things they wanted to do, but nothing happened. And now look at uh, verse 36. In verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. That's the goal. That's the goal of a peculiar person. He wants to make God known. He wants all the people that listen to him. He wants them to know that God is God. And that I am thy servant. And that I have done all these things at thy word. That's a peculiar person. Everything he does. Every doctrine he preaches. Everything he affirms. He affirms by the word of God. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me, that these people may know that thou art the Lord God. You see, that's the purpose of a peculiar person. He wanted the people to know that God is the creator. And for us today, that Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Christ, the very Son of God. And that thou hast turned their heart back again. You see that? He wanted the whole nation to come back to God. You see, there are people they say, well, he's planning as if he's the one that is going to convert the whole nation. That's right. That's right. That's the peculiar person we're talking about. He's always dreaming. He's always talking as if he is the one single-handedly is going to convert the whole nation. That's it. That's the peculiar person we're talking about. He said that everyone may come to know that God is God. Then he continued to pray. Look at uh, verse 38. Then uh, the fire of the Lord fell. It will always fall. 
when a peculiar person prays, it will fall. And as we become peculiar today and the fire will fall, the people will know that God is God indeed. And consume the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the doors and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, you are peculiar, they will say something. You pray, they will say something. You preach, they will say something. You testify, they will see something. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Tell me, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That's the purpose, that's the purpose of a peculiar preacher. You see, these are examples like you and I. I said before this time, they were ordinary. Before this time, they were just like, you know, cold, as cold as you are, as cold as I have been. But then, when the fire came on them, they became peculiar. P for Paul, E for Elijah, and C for Caleb. See for Caleb. We're looking at Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. You see if you're peculiar, these are the characteristics you'll find in your life. And when it says he gave himself so that he can redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. This is what will happen when you become peculiar, peculiar people, zealous of good works. Look at Numbers chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 24. Numbers 14, verse 24. It says in uh, verse 24 here, it tells us about this Caleb, and it says, But my servant Caleb, God will testify about you before angels. My servant Caleb, he'll testify about you before the whole nation. God will approve of your word because he says, That's my servant. I converted him, I cleansed him, I circumcised him, I purified him, I purged him. He has become peculiar. He'll testify about you. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, you'll have another spirit. A peculiar person is not like all the other people saying the same thing as they're saying. Everybody is just God is just discouraged. Everybody is complaining. He is complaining. Everybody is saying we cannot. He says we cannot. That's not a peculiar person. A peculiar person is a person who is different. His heart is different. His mind is different. His spirit is different. His soul is different. His passion is different. His goal is different. Everything about him is different. When other people are saying we cannot, he says yes we can. Yes we can. And somebody there say I can. It says, my servant, because he had another spirit with him, and he has followed me fully. That's a peculiar person. We don't follow halfway. We don't follow half-heartedly. We follow wholeheartedly. He says, him will I bring into the land wherein to he went, and his seed shall possess it. And let's look at a peculiar person. We're looking at um, uh, Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. Here I'm reading from verse 10. Joshua chapter 14 verse 10 and now behold the Lord has kept me alive he'll keep you alive Amen. revival is coming a pouring of the Holy Ghost is coming in a way it has never been done before in Jesus name he will keep you alive to see it. He'll keep you alive to experience it. He'll keep you alive to be part of this in Jesus' name. It has never happened that we're going to find deeper life member in every house of every city, of every town, of every village. It is coming. If you believe, say Amen. amen. You'll be alive. Amen. I'll be alive. Amen. You will not retire. Amen. You will not give up. Look at this, verse 10, and now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 40 and 5 years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day, look at this, look at this, and the man has not retired, I am this day, and the man is not using a walking stick, I am this day, and the man is not being led by my hand, I am this day, first call, and five years old this man is extraordinary this man is peculiar look at this and as yet i am as strong this day as i was in the day that moses sent me as my strength was then even so is my strength now are you there am i reading something that will happen to you he said for war but to go out and to come in now therefore give me this mountain now therefore Give me this man. 
at 85 years of age and he said now therefore give me this mountain he said i still want to walk i still want to run i still want to do the will of god that's a peculiar person it will happen to you in jesus name i'm talking about uriah now we're looking at uriah we're looking at second samuel second samuel chapter 18 second samuel Chapter 18. You see, when people are peculiar, you can tell. You can tell. You don't have to, you know, use a magnifying glass and be looking at their history and be looking at their records. So you can see, just look at them at a distance and you can see what we're talking about when we're talking about peculiarity. We're looking at a second Samuel chapter, tell me, chapter 11, really? Chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 6. Second Samuel chapter 11. 11 and we're reading from verse 6 look at this look at this and david saying to joab saying send me uriah the hittite and joab said to uriah to david and when uriah was come unto him david demanded of him how joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered and david said listen to this to uriah go down to thy house and wash thy feet and uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed him a mess of meat from the king but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house when they are told David sin, Uriah went not down unto his house David said unto Uriah camest thou not from thy journey why then didst thou not go down unto thy house? Look at a peculiar person now. Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord, my captain Joab, and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into my house to eat and to drink? And to lie with my wife, as thou livest, and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Look at somebody coming from the battlefield. His face, the battlefield, is had all the shooting of the guns, all the shooting of the arrows. He's seen many people fall, and he's seen danger there. He's seen difficulty there. He has seen everything that should make a man say, I'm coming out of this place. And then he came. And then uh, David said, go home to your wife. Enjoy yourself for some time. Take some vacation and take some break. He said, me, never. God forbid, I will not do that. The ark of the Lord is there. Israel is there the servants of god are there and the fighting is still going on i'm eager to go back to the battlefield that's a peculiar person it's not a person that's saying i'm going to hide my face i'm going to hide my head it's a dangerous time it's a difficult time and because of these difficulties and dangers i cannot go now he said i'm going back i'm going back to the battlefield i said i'm going back to the battlefield and you will do the will of god in jesus name you know when when duty calls even though there's danger along with that duty say god will preserve my life it will preserve your life in jesus name now we're looking at luke we're, look, we're seeing paul we're seeing elijah we're seeing caleb we're seeing uriah we're not looking at luke luke chapter one luke chapter one i'm reading from verse one luke chapter one we're looking at verse 1. Here he tells us, this is Luke now, it says, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also. Look at this. It seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. What's this talking about? It's talking about Luke writing the whole of the chapters 24 chapters onto a single person most noble most excellent theophilus 
This was just a follow-up message that he wrote for one person. That's peculiar. When you think you are following up a person, you tell him a story here, tell him a story here, tell him a story here, and that's all. And then you give him a lesson here, a lesson here, a lesson here, that's all. But look at what he has written. Very detailed. A person that will do this and write all this to just one person in follow-up, that's peculiar. And that's what the Lord is telling us that will be so thorough because you are peculiar. And the people you are following up will say, I've never seen a person like this before. He's so is taking and he goes through everything he dots every eye he crosses every t and he tells me every he answers all my questions he talks about jesus he talks about the salvation he talks about what we have to do he talks about everything and he does he doesn't uh, mind the time from chapter one to chapter two to chapter three he gives you all the details he needs to give you and you see here he wrote it to only one person and if you look at acts of the apostle from chapter one verses one to four the same thing after he has written this to just one person, to this same person, Theophilus, he wrote Acts of the Apostles again unto him. That's peculiar. That's peculiar. And that's what the Lord is telling us. He says, I want to raise you up as a peculiar person. It will happen in Jesus' name. And now, look at this look. He was, uh, what was his profession? I said, what was his profession? You know what happened? He abandoned that profession because the work of God was so much on him and was following Paul about. When you read in the Acts of the Apostles, we went, we went, we did, we saw, we stayed, we abode, all that we, we. That means uh, Luke was there. That means that how about his profession? In fact, Paul the Apostle said when he was writing uh, to Timothy, he said, only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. The thing came upon him. It was his soul. It was his mind. It was his heart. It was his brain. It was his blood. Everything about him was just the gospel now. He forgot his profession. That's what you are talking about. That you look at these souls and they're so important to you and you are driven by the fire within. I pray it will happen in Jesus' name. We're looking at Isaiah now because the next person that we'll see as peculiar is Isaiah. Look at this Isaiah. I'm looking at chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 1. It says uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, and the stream filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, and one at six wings uh, were twain. He covered his feet and were twain. He covered his face, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The post of uh, the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. This is a peculiar person. He has been preaching the word from chapter 1, from chapter 2, from chapter 3, and then chapter 4, and then chapter 5. Here comes chapter 6. After he had been preaching effectively, he wasn't preaching false doctrine, and then he saw the glory of God, and the thing moved him. There are some people, if they have been preachers, and they now hear the word of God, revelation of the word of God, it doesn't move them. It's like, uh, yes, that's how God should be. Holy, holy, holy. God is holy. And then the angels to cover themselves. That they'll be giving interpretation that means they're humble they'll be looking at everything fixing everything up but i say when he saw that he said woe is me i'm undone because i'm a man of unclean leaves I, and i dwell in the midst of the people of unclean leaves for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts then flew one of the seraphims unto me uh, having a life coal in his hand which he had taken with tongues from off the altar and he laid it upon my mouth you are going to have a new experience fire will come upon your mouth and your tongue will be a tongue of fire. Your heart will be fired up in Jesus' name. And he said, this, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away. And thy sin, Paul, that sanctification right there, also I heard, also I heard, also I heard, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Isaac could have said, he's talking to other people, 
I'm already a group pastor. I'm already a state overseer. I'm already a region overseer. I'm already a preacher. I'm already in this section for the youth. I'm already in this section for the choir. I'm already in this area because I'm already a prophet. Or oh, when he says, whom shall I send? He's talking to those people who don't have any office. They don't have any position. They don't have anything they're doing. Not Isa. These are peculiar people. These are the people when they hear the voice of God, there's something to be done. There's the work to be done. They come immediately and they surrender themselves. Then said I, here am I, send me. Somebody, here am I, send me. I can't hear the people of God. If you're a woman, can you send you? I said if you're a woman, can you send you? If you're a man, can you send you? It will send us in Jesus' name. And now, peculiar people, Apollos. Apollos. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles. We're looking at chapter 18. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. And I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 24. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. We're reading from verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria. An eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This peculiar. This is peculiar. There was no printing at that time. Everybody did not have a copy of the Bible to himself. But he found out. He said, wherever that Bible is, it's in the temple, I'll dig it out. It's in the synagogue, I'll find it out. And then he went to the synagogue, he went to the Bible that's available, Old Testament, available for them. Everybody was not carrying about the Bible like you're doing today, but he sought for the scriptures. And he found the scriptures. And he read the scriptures. And he studied the scriptures. And we're told he was mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and was being fervent in spirit. Fervent in spirit. Anytime you listen to Apollos, it wasn't like a dull person sleeping, sluggish, uh, sluggish and slumbering. Not at all. Fervent in spirit. His spirit was on fire. And then he says, he spake and he taught. How did he teach? Diligently. He wasn't in hurry. Line upon line and precept upon precept. He taught the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Oh, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and they expanded unto him the way of God more perfectly. This is a peculiar person. You know, people like this who are fervent in spirit, people like this who are mighty in the scriptures, people like this who are already confident and they have conviction, they have backbone to their, to their faith. When other people come to them, they want to, you know, talk to them, to improve on them. They say, go look for other people. Didn't you hear me? Don't you see how fervent I am? He was peculiarly humble. And then we're told in verse, uh, in verse 26, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. Who, when he was come, he helped them much which had believed through grace. Helped them much, never lazy, never idle, never finding not doing something. And for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now the Rechabites. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35. You see, these were peculiar people, peculiar people. And this is what the Lord wants to do in us, and he wants to do with us, that he will take hold of every one of us, and he will so cleanse and purge and purify us, it will make us peculiar, zealous of good works in Jesus' name. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 35, I'm reading here from verse 1, the word, the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites, and they speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. And then I took Jezaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites, the whole family of the Rechabites, the whole tribe of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the 
the Lord into the chamber of the sons of Hanan and the son of Igdaliah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber and the Meaziah, and uh, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I said before, the sons of the house of the Rechabites, pours full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, drink ye wine. You know, when somebody like Jeremiah, a noted person, an authoritative person, a prophet of the Lord, and he came to them and he said, here is wine, and there are pots of wine, and here are cups for you to drink, and he commanded them, drink wine. You know, the ordinary person will say, well, he's our senior in the faith. He is a person who had come before us. He, has, he had the word of God. And God has told him to do this. And what are we that we are going to change anything? Because uh, you know that's uh, so and so, that's so and so. But not these people. These are peculiar people. The people that know the reason why they believe what they believe. Not that after they have believed all this for 5 years, 7 years, 10 years, 15, 20 years. They go for a meeting somewhere. And then they see something. Everything that they have known for 15 years. Everything will change. Those are not peculiar people. Paul, thank God I'm peculiar. I say thank God I'm peculiar. Look at this, but they said in verse 6, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, uh, uh, father commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons. For how long? He said, what we believe is not for one year. Our faith is what we will contend for all the days of our lives. They say forever. Neither, neither shall ye build a house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. But all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land, where ye be strangers. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he, he had charged us to to drink no wine all our days we our wives our sons nor our daughters and then they went to honor and God honored their consecration he will honor your consecration honor your commitment no compromise at all look at 18 verse 18 and Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites thus says the Lord of hosts the God of Israel because he have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father and kept all his precepts and done according to all that he has commanded you therefore thus says the Lord of hosts the God of Israel Jonadab the son of Rechab shall not lack, shall not want, shall not miss, shall not lose a man to stand before me. How long? Forever. These are preeminently men and women of one thing. These people, they were honest. These people, they were strong. They were uncompromising. They were fervent to see only one thing in life and to care for only one thing in life and to live for only one thing in life and to pursue only one thing in life and to achieve just one thing in life they were swallowed up in only one thing that is to please God and to see souls saved to see souls sanctified souls steadfast and established in Christ when we say somebody is peculiar it's a man of one goal a man of one way a man of one word a man of one pursuit, a man of one priority, a man of one desire, is swallowed up in just one thing. He says, I want to see the land covered by the gospel with the gospel as the waters cover the sea. That's what I want to see in this land. And if you're a man like that, the Lord is about to use you. He will use you tremendously. And you are not going to turn back. You are going to be following the Lord, following the Lord until the final end in Jesus' name. I come to point number two. The earnestness of Christ's purified, zealous people. The earnestness. Well, coming back to Titus. Titus chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2. We're reading from verse 14. Here he tells us, Titus 2, 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself. What kind of people? A peculiar people. And what happens to them? Zealous of good works, honest, honest. The people 
of uh, the world seem to be more earnest for evil works than the children of God are for good works. And look at them on the, on the uh, football field and look at those who are playing and look at those who are, you know, at the spectators uh, corner and they're clapping and shouting and all that. Look at them in their dancing halls. Look at them in their Hollywood, uh, you know, kind of uh, shows. Look at them everywhere they go. They're zealous. They're, they're passionate. Even the people that are doing evil, the people that are, you know, committing sin, whatever it is they are doing they put all their hearts into it but when chill, the children of God when they come out now to do something you don't see any earnestness it's like you know we were just going like that and we're cold and we're lukewarm we're indifferent we're lethargic we're apathetic and we lack interest in spiritual things I pray that things will turn around and so that you know will not be the people when you go for their football field they're not looking at time they're not saying hey, when are they going to finish the game they're just there their heart, their mind, everything. And they pay to get in there. They pay to watch all those things, but all their hearts are there. But a person that is purified by the Lord, all the draws, the Lord will cleanse everything away. All the things that tie us down, the Lord will cut everything, root and branch in Jesus' name. So that now, by the grace of God, we love what God loves. We hate what God hates. We desire what God desires. And we're zealous for good works. These are the purpose and the goal of a, how, why God has given us the purification experience, the sanctification experience. In what, uh, let's look at uh, just, just, one, uh, just one thing about the people of the world. I'm looking, at, uh, I'm looking at Micah, Micah chapter 7. The people of the world, look at them. Look at the way they are. You know them already. And you know that they is how zealous they are in the things they do in the world. We're looking at Micah chapter 7, Micah chapter 7, verses uh, 2 and 3. It says, the good man is perished out of the earth. Where are the righteous people? Where are the people that stand for righteousness? In the offices, in the marketplace, in everywhere in the community, the good man is perished out of the earth. And there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. You read that in newspapers, maybe you have heard about uh, you know, somebody that happened to you, and they haunt every man, his brother with a net. Look at this. That they may do evil with how many hands? Both hands. How do they do that? Earnestly. Earnestly. What they do? They do earnestly. The people who do evil, the people who commit sin, who hurt other people's lives, who, the, you know, you know what they do? It says, with both hands earnestly, the prince asketh and the judge asketh for reward and the great man he ought, he uttereth his mischievous desire and they wrap it up. They close it up. They so do it is they use intelligence. They use wisdom. They use everything they can use so that the people that come Come into their net will not come out again. When those people are doing evil, when they put all their strength, all their energy, all their knowledge, they study internet, they study IT, they, they use all the things, all the gadgets that uh, you know people who should we should use it for good things, they use it for evil, and that is the way they are. But by the grace of God, we are going to be honest in Jesus' name. In fact, were we not told in Jude chapter one, verse three, Jude chapter one, verse three how we ought to be honest 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 because it says beloved verse three when i give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should do what how do we do it earnestly fervently carefully diligently and uh, oh, it says uh, earnestly content for the faith which was once delivered Unto the saints, he wants us to be very earnest. We're going to be earnest in Jesus' name. We're talking about people that have zeal. You know, people who have zeal, who are they? The people that have zeal, they're zealous for the Lord, zealous for the kingdom of God. I'm looking at uh, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. Luke chapter 1, I'm looking at uh, chapter, chapter 1 and verse 5. Look at this. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named, what's the name here? Tell me out aloud. 
Zacharias of the cause of Abiah and his wife was uh, of uh, the daughters of uh, Aaron and then he goes on to say and her name was Elizabeth they were both righteous before God purified both righteous before God sanctified both righteous before God these were people they were already getting you know it says walking in how in many commandments of the Lord all the commandments and all the ordinances of the Lord tell me the last word there blameless and they had no child ah look at this and yet they kept on serving the Lord you keep on serving the Lord because that Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years what does that mean very old very old and yet they were serving the Lord uh, Zechariah, when are you going to retire? When are you going to, you know, because you are above, above 60 now, above 70 now, when are you going to retire? He said, no, we don't retire. This is the work of God. And we're going to do, and yet she, he had no child. And Elizabeth, there was no child. And yet they went on and on and on. I pray you'll be as zealous like that in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Esther. Esther chapter, Esther chapter 4. In Esther chapter 4, hey, this is how we find people that, who have zeal in the Lord. Zechariah, at zeal in the Lord and you know old and still serving the Lord you'll serve the Lord till your old age you'll not give up you'll not back up you'll not slow down you'll not fall you'll not leave the mountain and go to the valley stricken in years will be serving the Lord look at look at Esther chapter 4 Esther chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 15 then Esther bid them return Mordecai they answer go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days night or day I also I also the queen I also in a great position of authority I also in a respectable position I also so, and my maidens will fast likewise. So will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. Tell me the rest here. And if I perish, I perish. That's somebody having zeal. That's somebody having zeal. You see, Zechariah, she he had zeal. Esther, she had zeal. Look at Abraham. Abraham, we're looking at um, Genesis chapter Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 16. Genesis chapter 22, verse 16. Here is the Lord saying, and he said, By myself have I sworn, says the Lord, says the Lord, for because thou hast done this sin and has not withheld thy son thine only son from God you see there are people something is too precious to them Abraham had been waiting for this son Isaac for 25 years and eventually a child came and when the child came God said go sacrifice that child for me it was a test of his faith a test of his earnestness a test of his zeal a test of his commitment and God said because you have not withheld that precious thing from me there will be nothing so precious in your life you will withdraw from the Lord your time so precious will give it to the Lord your treasure so precious will give to the Lord everything you have you give to the Lord in Jesus name that in blessing verse 17 I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and the, as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because 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 thou hast obeyed my voice you see when you are zealous whatever the Lord is telling you he says give this time and give this treasure and give this spirit for Follow up on those people, get them to get saved, really saved, and get those backslider, get them to the Lord. Whatever difficulties on the way, you give everything you have, it will be done in Jesus' name. And here now we're looking at uh, we're looking at Lazarus. We're looking at John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 9. John chapter 12, reading from verse 9. It says, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus sake only but that they might see Lazarus 
not for not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus. Does that happen to you that somebody is coming to church and he says, "Yes, I'm going to church, but I'm going to hear the preaching, and I'm going to hear the music, and I'm going to hear the prayer, I'm going to enjoy the worship." But not only that, I know so and so is going to be there. I just like to get sight of him. I like to get sight of her because I know he's a man that has the touch of God in his life, has the power of God in his life. Look at this here. They came not only because of Jesus, but because they will see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Look at verse 10. But the chief priests reconsulted that they might do what? But Lazarus also to death, because by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and talk now and believed on Jesus. The point is, why do we bring him in here? We bring him in there because this is a man that was honest for the Lord. He knew they, were, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him because through him, many people are going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say, this is the time to be very careful because they're looking for me. This is the time to hide myself somewhere. This is the time to go and put my head under cover somewhere. And when Jesus comes, my heart is there, my mind is there, but I cannot go there physically because if I went there, those cheap priests are looking for me. He was honest. He said, forget about those cheap priests underneath me are the everlasting arms around me are angels of God like mountains surround Jerusalem and within me greater is he that is in me that he that is in the world I'm going there they couldn't lay hands on him and it will happen the same thing will happen to you in Jesus name I'm coming to are you tired I said are you tired you want to have zeal in your heart fire in your soul power in your spirit it will happen in jesus name i'm looking at first kings first kings chapter 18 first kings chapter 18 i'm reading from verse 7 this is about obadiah obadiah and as obadiah was in the way behold elijah met him and he knew him and he fell on his face and said i doubt that my lord elijah and he said, and he answered him, I am. Go tell thy master, behold, Elijah is here. I will be like Elijah. I said, I will be like Elijah. And he said, what have I seen? That thou shouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me. As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord has not said to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee, see whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Look at this now. This is what we are talking about. Was it not told my Lord? What I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I single-handedly, how I alone by myself, how I endangered my life, how I had, I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. You see that when Jezebel was killing the prophets because he knew the plan of Jezebel and he wanted the word of God to still remain in the land. He was searching for the prophets himself and yet he was walking in the palace. He was walking under the uh, supervision of Ahab and Jezebel and he got a hundred prophets as he was looking for them single-handedly and went to hide them and every day, every day he will be sending food to them. That's an unexpected person. You'll be honest. You'll be dutiful. And you'll do everything you need to do in Jesus' name. Uh, again, uh, we've read about Uriah. Just write that down. Uriah and then Stephen. We're coming to, we're coming to Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. 
I'm reading here from verse 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, verse 3. It says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. Stephen was of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. Um, Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And then we're told in verse 5, And the same pleased the whole multitude, and the chose, what's the name? Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. You'll be full of faith. You'll be full of the Holy Ghost. Look at this in verse, in verse 6. It says, Whom they searched before the apostles when they had prayed and laid hands on them. We're told in verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, he did great wonders and miracles among the people. And then there was an argument and all that. But look at verse 15. And all day, all that such in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. I, I used those people uh, for zealous, Z, uh, for that's uh, Zechariah. E, that's for Esther, A, that's for Abraham, L, that's Lazarus, O, that's Obadiah, U, that's Uriah, and S, that's Stephen. And you see these people, if God could make something, somebody zealous out of them, he can do it in your life. I said he can do it in your life. Be zealous, they neglected everything else for the sake of God's calling. They looked at God's calling in their lives and they said this is it. What they were going to commit their life and everything they had to, they gave their first attention. They gave their first thoughts. They gave their best time to the one thing, business in God's heart. They were men and women of one thing. Their hearts were not divided. Your heart will not be divided. You see, if your heart is, you know, like part of you is there, part of you is there, part of you the other place, you'll not be able to do what the Lord has called you to do. But when you are focused, when you're fixed, and when you center your affection, everything you have on things above, I pray that what the Lord wants you to do, this good work of eternal value, you will do in Jesus' name. Nothing will pull you down. Nothing will tie you down. Nothing will hold you back. And you'll be zealous, peculiar for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Point number three, exploits. Somebody shout exploits. I can't hear my people. I will do exploits. I said I will do exploits. Point number three, the exploits of Christ's passionate, zealous people. The exploits of Christ's passionate, zealous people. You see, when the, as the Lord calls us, at such a time in which we're living now, He wants us to be men and women that do exploits. In Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 11, and I'm reading here from verse 32, Daniel 11 verse 32, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. While all that is going on, but the people that do know their God, the people that do know their God, the people that do know their God, they'll be strong. Well, you know that God is by you, and God is for you, and God is before you, and God is above you like an umbrella, and you're under the wing of a shadow, and God is and is underneath you, and His power surrounds you, and God is within you. Everywhere you move, you move in the power of the Lord. The people that do know their God, they shall be strong, and what will they do? And they shall do exploits, doing exploits for Christ and his eternal kingdom demands zeal. As much zeal as that of those who labor in earthly kingdom. Those who labor for the wind, those who labor for the world. These people who are laboring for the things that will soon pass away, they, 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 are, all ex, they are all excited. They have passion. They have relentlessness. Uh, they, let us demonstrate then the same zeal, even higher zeal. The same fervency even higher fervency, the same commitment, even higher commitment and the same power, even higher power on ending interest in serving and harvesting the field of humanity for our God. Be zealous. I said be zealous. Be focused. Do good works. Do the work of an evangelist. Do express for Christ our Savior and our Lord. Give him the first place in your life and walk until he comes. I will. I said I will. I said I will. 
you will maintain good works in Jesus' name. Look at First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 16, First Corinthians chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. It says in First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruit of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves. They have addicted themselves. They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Look at the ministry. Look at the movement. Look at the calling. Look at what God is calling us to. And it says, bring yourself to do the work. Bring your soul, your spirit, your mind, your talent, everything you've got, and addict yourself to it. Do it every day. Do it every time. Do it with everything that you have got. Souls are coming to the kingdom. I say souls are coming to the kingdom. They will come through you. They will come through you. Fire will burn inside you. And you will influence people, inspire people, raise them up, follow them up. And let us do this work where we will not be tired. I said we will not be tired. Let us rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I am ready now. Good works, good works, good works. I'm ready now. I will do the work of the Lord. I will do this work. I will not go back. I will not go back. I will not go back. I will not slow down. Let the fire burn. Let the fire burn. And let your zeal show before the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. I'm available. Get addicted to the work of God.